morning. Good. Masech the Tomid, Perikimu Mishnah Aleph. Just to remind ourselves of where we're up to. The first pious, the first lottery has been done. <clears throat> Our winner was Zaifa to the Trumas Hadeshen, taking the ash off the Mizbeah. A shovel full of ash off the Mizbeah that was done every day. <clears throat> After that was done, Kohanim came with pitchforks and shovels and they cleaned off the Maroch and Gedola, which is our Tomid Diagram 3. They cleaned off this area of the Mizbeah, southeast, to remove whatever ash was there, whatever animal limbs were there, whatever animal limbs had not been consumed, they put on the Mizbeah, empty place on the Mizbeah or on the ramp. The Kohanim with the shovels took the ash, put it in the middle of the Mizbeah, the Tapuach, the area was now clean. Kohanim then brought up logs to the Mizbeah. The Kohen who won our lottery for Chumas Hadesh and set up the logs. We learned how that was done. <clears throat> this area of the Mizbeah was also clean for the, the Marocha for Kitoris. Kohanim brought the logs up here. Our lottery winner for Chumas Hadesh and set up the logs here. After these two marachos were set up, he lit the fire, or actually, he, depending upon what shita, he took the limbs of the animal that had animals that hadn't been consumed from the day before that were around the mizbeach or on the ram, put them on the mar the new, refreshed maracha gedola. He lit the fire in the maracha gedola and the maracha shal ketores, and then this this uh, could have been done before dawn. And then the Kohen, who won our lottery, also took two additional pieces of wood, Shnei Gezire Eitzim, and put it on top of the Maroch and Gedola. And you can only do that once it was day, one after dawn. And we're now ready. The Mizbech is now ready. The Maroch and Gedola is fresh. The Maroch and Ketores is fresh. The third Maroch, which is a fire, to be Makayim Eish Tamid Tukat Ala Mizbech Lo Sichbeh, to make sure there was a fire on the Mizbech 24 7. So if anything had to be done here, this was also uh, taken care of at this point. And now we're ready to move on to the next lottery. Before we move on to the next lottery, I want to go back to something we talked about Tamid uh, Midos Diagram 3. We said that if you look in the Ezra's Noshim, there's a room in the Ezra's Noshim, a corner chamber called Lishkat Ha'etzim. Right there, Lishkat Ha'etzim. <clears throat> and this is the room in which they stored logs. Kohanim who were Bali Mumin, who had certain uh, blemishes, physical blemishes that did not allow them to do the avod in the Beis HaMikdash, they would be allowed to go into this Lishkat HaEitzim and they would inspect the logs. If the logs were still damp and there were worms in them, they couldn't use it for the Mizbeah. If the logs were dry but had worms, they would be able to cut out that area of the wood. That uh, bedika of the wood was done in the Slishkat HaEitzim by Kohanim Huobale Mumin. According to one shot, remember we learned about the Shar HaDelek, which is on your southern wall. You have the Shar HaDelek. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Right there, Shar HaDelek. Delek means for us today gasoline, but it means combustion. So one sheet holds that after the wood was inspected in the Lishkat Ha'etzim, which is the Ezra's Nashim, they took the wood out of the Lishkat Ha'etzim, they took it into the Chayel, and they walked across the Chayel, all the way to the west, from west to south, south back towards east, 
and they put it in the Shar Hadelek. And the Shah Hadelek kept a certain amount of logs in it that were needed for the daily routine. And from the Shar Hadelek, there was a little room there that they kept the wood. They would be able to bring the wood to the Mizbeach here. At any rate, the inspection of the wood for the Maroch occurred in the Shar Lishkat Ha'etz and Ezra's Nashim. And one way or another, whether they got it to the Shar Hadelek and then to the Mizbeach, or from the Lishkat Eitzim directly to the Mizbeach, this is where the Eitzim, the wood, the logs originated. So we are now in Perek Gimel, Mishnah Aleph. That part of the Avodah, the first Pais, is done. Though we have a lottery winner, we've cleaned the... <clears throat> We've cleaned the southeastern uh, corner of the Mizbeach. We've cleaned the southwestern corner of the Mizbeach. We set up the logs. We uh, lit the fire. We put yesterday's limbs that weren't consumed on the Marach Gedola. The Kohen, after dawn, when, when light hit, he put the two additional pieces of wood on the Marach Gedola. That part of the day is done. Now we need to figure out how we're going to bring the new carbon. We have a fresh mara, a fresh wood, fresh logs. We need to now go to a new pious, a second lottery. There'll be four lotteries. I want to emphasize, as I did, I believe, a few days ago, the pious lottery system was only done in the morning, meaning there's a carbon tomid brought in the morning, tomid shal shachar, and there's a carbon tomit that's brought, Bain Harbayim. And that's the afternoon carbon tomit. So we dive in Shachris for the carbon tomit shall Shachar. And have your man who will rebuild the base Hamikdash will have the carbon. We dive in Mincha for the carbon tomit shall Bain Harbayim. Yet Shem will build the base Hamikdash. We'll have the carbon tomit shall Bain Harbayim. And the whole of in the base Hamikdash. The pious was only done in the morning. Meaning that a Kohen who won the lottery to sprinkle the blood of the Korban Tomit Shal Shacha, that same Kohen sprinkled the dam, the blood of the Korban Tomit Shal Bein Harban. They didn't have a second set of lotteries for the Avoda of the afternoon. Whatever particular Kohen was Zohar to do in the morning, he was Zohar to do in the afternoon. Obviously, the first pious, which is Trumas Hadeshen, and setting up the Marocha, was not repeated in the afternoon. In the afternoon, they did not clean the corners of the Mizbech to put on new logs. They only did that the next uh, day before dawn. That was done once a day. So that pious that represents Trumas Hadeshen, taking off some ash from the Mizbech, setting up the two areas of wood logs on the Mizbeah, cleaning off the top of the Mizbeah. That was done only early morning or before morning kit. That's the only time it was done. Beginning with our second lottery, which is going to be who's going to shech the animal, who's going to sprinkle the blood, etc. Whoever won the lottery to shech the Korban Tomit Shal Shachar, he shechted the carbon tomit shall by Nabai. Whoever won the lottery to sprinkle the blood in the morning, he was the one that sprinkled the blood in the afternoon. There's not a second set of lotteries for the carbon tomit shall be by him. This Mishnah is now going to describe the second lottery. In terms of mechanism, procedure, it's done the same way. <clears throat> if we look at the end of Tomid Perek Bays, the Mishnah we read, it says that after the Marochos, the logs were set up on the Mizbeach, and yesterday's unconsumed animals were put back on the Marocha, and the Marocha was lit, and two additional pieces of wood were put on the Marocha, the last words in Perak Beis, the Yardu of Olahem Lishkas Hagazis. The Kohanim then went into the Lishkas Hagazis, which is the, really the room where the Sanhedrin sat. In your Midos Perek, um, a diagram three, Lishkas Hagazis is on the northern wall of the Azara, 
We learned part of it was in the Azara, so it's Kodesh, no one can sit there except the sign of the Davidic dynasty. And the, <clears throat> the northern part of the Lishkas Hagazas, uh, you can sit in. <clears throat> so the Kohanim gathered for the pious. We have my Mahashev. Yeah, here's my Mahashev as well. This is what the people who ordered will be receiving. Some of you received it. Some of you will be receiving it today, courtesy of Lady Blumenfeld, who is graciously delivering them. Um, it's actually, it's beautiful. And today will be the last day, and Mir Chen will be working through the scans. Beginning on your mission, we'll be working through simply looking at pages in the Bahashiva Savoda. So here's a, a picture of Bahashiva Savoda. This is the Lishka Sagazis, and this is for the second lottery. So the Kohanim are standing here because this is the southern area of the Lishka Sagazis, which is in the Kodesh, and therefore the Kohanim that want to be involved in the second lottery are standing here. This is the part of the Lishka Sagazis that's on the northern side of the room, which means it's outside the Azara. And therefore, there's a person in charge of the pious that can be sitting because he's not in the Kodesh part of the Lishka Sagaza. So that was, this is what the pious would look like. And the mechanism, the procedure is the same. If let's say there are 15 Kohanim here, the person in charge of the pious, the Mamuna, the supervisor of the lottery, there are 15 supervisors in the base Hamikdash. We learned about several of them. This is the Mamuna, the supervisor of the lotteries. He would take a look at the Kohanim quickly and, and just estimate in his mind, they're 15, 16, 18. And then he would select the number that's greater than the people, the Kohanim he saw. So if he sees in his, at least in his uh, vision, 18 Kohanim, he would say 30, 40, 82, whatever number he picks, he'd scream it out, 82. He would then come over to the Kohanim, take off one Kohen's hat. The Kohanim would put out fingers. So in Yuma, they discuss what fingers they were able to put out. And he would start counting fingers. When he got to 82, um, that's the winner of pious number two. And the reason he took off one Kohen's hat, as we mentioned, is if he lost track of his numbers, he couldn't remember what he was up to, to keep the system fair, he would always start counting from where he counted the first time before he got messed up. So the person's, there was a coin whose hat was off, so he always knew that if he had to restart from somewhere, that's the coin to restart from. So this is where the pious is occurring. <clears throat> What's going to happen here is there's gonna be declared one winner. Let's make believe there are 16 Kohanim in this picture. The Mamuna, the supervisor said 82, and he counts round and round, and he gets to 80, the 82nd finger, and he says, you win. That person who won is going to be Zoha into the Shechita of the Korban Tomit Shel Shachar, and he's also going to be Zoha in the Shechita of the Korban Tomit Shel Bain Ha'arbayim. But now we're going to add 12 more people. The second... The second lottery resulted in 13 winners. The way we get 13 winners is first we get the first winner, number 82. And then 12 more Kohanim that are to the right of number 80, finger number 82. The next 12 are going to also be winners. So we're going to have 13 winners in lottery number two. Lottery number one, which occurred before dawn, there was one winner the one who is going to do the Truma Sadeshin. In lottery number two, we're gonna have 13 winners. Finger 82 is winner one, and he's gonna do the Shrita of the carbon. And then the person to his right is gonna be the next winner to do the next thing. The next person, number three, is gonna do the next thing. So there are gonna be 13 winners in lottery number two, and that's what the mission is going to explain to us now how we get the 13 winners and what these 13 winners do. Amalem Hamamuna. The Mamuna said to the Kohanim 
who are now organized in the Lishkas Hagazis, as we saw in the as we saw in the picture of Ahashe Vesavo. Bo Vafi, so gather around, in other words, make a semicircle, and we're gonna do the lottery. And what are we going to give out, quote unquote, as the privileges for, t- for now? Mishohe, if you want to ca- count with, uh, with me uh, or on paper or mark it on your, on your Mishnayas, you can do it. We're going to see we get 13 winners. Mishohe, number one. They number the, the supervisor said 82. He counts, he gets to finger 82. That's the Shochet. Mizarek, the person to his right, is the one that's going to collect the blood in a vessel after the Shriva. He's going to then take the vessel and walk it to the Mizbeah, and then he's going to sprinkle the blood on the Mizbeah, which are three separate abodos, but one Kohen wins the three. A carbon has four abodos, Shrita, Kabbalah, Holacha, Zerika. The shechting of the animal, the collecting the blood after the shechita, bringing the vessel to the mezbeah, and then sprinkling the blood on the mezbeah. Four different kohanim can do that avod, according to most sheep, according to many sheep. Of those four, shechita, shechting a carbon, can be done by a czar. A levi can do it, a Yisrael can do it. It doesn't have to be a kohen. Nevertheless, the Mepharshim tell us that for the carbon Tomit Shal Shaka and the carbon Tomit Shal Bayim, they did select a Kohen through the pious. If a Yisrael happens to have shafted the carbon Tomit Shal Shaka, a carbon Tomit Shal it's a kosher carbon. Just like a Yisrael can walk into the Beis Hamikdash and say, I'd like to bring a carbon Toda and I want to shaft it myself, he's allowed to shaft it and the collection of the blood taking the blood to the Mizbeach in the vessel and sprinkling the blood, that must be done by the Kohen, but a Shechita can be done by a non-Kohen. So the winner, finger 82, is the Shochet. The person to his right is collecting the blood. He's going to walk it to the Mizbeach and sprinkle it on the Mizbeach, and that's called the Zori. That's Kohen number two. Mi Midashe Mizbeach Hapnimi. That's our Kohen number three. We're just moving to the right of finger 82. So who's the Kohen that's going to go into the Heichel? Midas diagram three. We need a Kohen to go up the steps, the 12 steps, into the Ulam, into the Heichel. And the first thing you approach when you walk into the Heichel is the Mizbeach, the small Mizbeach. Upon which, upon which incense was burned. This misbeh needs to be cleaned, just like the outer misbeh had to be cleaned from the ash and the animal limbs of the day before, which we did in the first lottery. Now we need to get the misbeh inside the hair of the Keturus misbeh clean for new Keturus for today. So someone, a Kohen has to go into the Hegel and take the ash of yesterday's Keturus off the misbeh and that's called Dishon Mizbeach Hapnimi. That's your Kohen number, th- winner number three. Winner number four, Mi Medashin Es HaMenorah. I'm reading Paragimel Mishnah Aleph. <clears throat> and that began on page 16 of your Masech the Tamid. Winner number four, Mi Medashin Es HaMenorah. The menorah is on the southern wall of the uh, Hegel, and that too had to be uh, cleaned and refreshed. It has yesterday's oil, yesterday's wicks, it could have ash in it. We need to get the menorah cleansed, refreshed for today's Hadlokas HaMenorah, uh, even though that's going to occur later in the afternoon, but we get all this ready in the morning, according to Roshidas. Why do we clean the Mizbeach HaKetores before we clean the Menorah? And that the Gemara tells us for the reason that we're all acquainted with, Ein Mavirin Al HaMitzvah. You don't skip over a mitzvah or mitzvah bol yodcha 
al tachlit sena. Whether they're the same or different, you want to take a look. You can study Megillah Vav Amabes, which we'll discuss in a moment. But there's a concept called Eimad Vivin Ala Mitzvahs. You don't pass over the opportunity to do a mitzvah. So a Kohen walked into the Heichel, winner number three, and what's the first thing that he will approach? The Mizbeach. Well, then the Mizbeach has to be cleaned before the cleansed before the menorah because the menorah is further west in the Heichel. So if a Kohen would walk into the Heichel, walk by the Mizbeach, and go clean the menorah, he will have passed the opportunity to do a mitzvah and go on to the next mitzvah. You're not allowed to do that. So the winner, number three of lottery number two, walked into the heichel, he sees the mizbeach needs cleaning, he cleans the mizbeach because he can't pass by, he can't be marv in the mitzvah. Koei number four can come in, and since the Mizbeah HaKtoris is now clean, he can go to the menorah and clean the menorah. The reason is, you don't pass over a mitzvah. So, for example, the Gemara in Megillah has a discussion about if it's a leap year, what month to make Ad, what, make, what month will you make Purim? We take for granted that Purim is an Adar Beis. Two sheets in the Gemara, it's not that simple. One sheet that says that Purim is to be celebrated in Adar 1, because Eimavir and Ala Mitzvah, so Mitzvah Boliyot, Al Tach you can read the Rashi there, you can read Tosus there, Megillah Vav Amibes. It's Adar. We can celebrate Purim. No, 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 let's wait till Adar Beis. Why are you going to wait till Adar Beis? You, you have an opportunity to do a Mitzvah, it's Adar. Read the Megillah, say Mishloch Manas, eat the soup. No, no, I'm going to wait to add the base. So <clears throat> the sheet in the Gemara says you can't do that, and therefore you celebrate Purim and Adar Aleph. The second sheet though says, for reasons discussed in Megillah, no, you wait to add base, and we pass, and you wait to add base. That's an example of Eimar Vir and Ala Mitzvah, so Mitzvah Bo Yod Galtach Mitzena. Another example is for men. Fill it in the morning. You have to put on your shel yad, and you have to put on then your shel rosh. In that order, we learn it out of a pasuk. What happens if you put your hand into your tefillin bag and you pull out your tefillin, one of the tefillin, and it turns out to be the shel rosh? Now, what do you do? Under the rule of emaf yirnal amitzvus, you would have to put on the shel rosh first. You have the mitzvah. It's in your hand. To put it down and take out the shoyad means you skip over the shorosh to do the shoyad. That's why we're careful when we put our hands in the tefillin bag to make sure we're pulling out the shoyad. What happens if the shorosh comes out first? So by the technical rule of Ema and ala mitzvos, you should have to put on your shorosh first. But this is an exception. Because we have a specific Pasuk that teaches us that the Shalyad must go on before the Shalrosh, if you pull the Shalrosh out first by mistake, you put the Shalrosh back underneath the bag, take out the Shalyad, put on the Shalyad, and then put on the Shalrosh. That's an example, uh, an unusual example, where you would take a mitzvah that's in your hand, put it down, and go to another mitzvah. But that's because we have a specific Pasuk that says, Shal Yad before Shal Rosh. If there's no such specific Pasuk, then there's a rule, Eimah Vir Nala Mitzvah. So when the Kohen walks into the Heichel and he sees, the first thing he sees is the Mizbeah, Haktoris needs cleaning. He can't walk further west and go clean the menorah because that would be Mavir Nala Mitzvah. Therefore, the Kohen winner, number three, cleans the top of the Mizbeah, Haktoris. Then Kohen number four, walks in, the winner number four comes in and cleans off, cleans out the menorah. We're now continuing with our winners. Remember, we have 13 winners in this lottery. The first, number one, is the winner to shech the animal, the Kormitomim Shoshacha. The second one is going to collect the blood, walk it in the vessel with the vessel to the Mizbeach, sprinkle on the Mizbeach. Our winner number three is going to clean the Mizbeach, Haktoris, and the Hegel. Our winner number four is going to clean the menorah in the Hegel. Winner number five. Now, 
when the number five begins a process of six Kohanim who are going to be responsible to deal with the different parts of the animal that are going to have to be brought on the Mizbeah. If you remember when we were learning Masechta Midas in our diagram number three, we had the Mizbeah, then we had the Beit Hamid Bachayim, this is where the animals were actually uh, shechted, and then there were different kinds of tables and hooks in this area, where after the animal was shechted, the animal would then be cut into different pieces. And in certain cases, not in this case, certain parts would be eaten by a Kohen, certain parts may be eaten by the owners. This is a carbon Ola. The morning Ola, the afternoon Ola, completely consumed on them is bad. Nobody eats from it, not a Kohen, not in this world. The only thing that's given out is the hide is given out to Kohanim. So it's in this area that the animal was cut into the necessary pieces as required by halacha. These pieces of the animal now had to be brought where? To the misbeah, because they were going to be consumed on the misbeah. So, diagram number six, Tommy diagram number six. They were going to now be a total of six kohanim that are going to be responsible for bringing the different parts of the animal to the ramp, not on the Mizbeach yet. They're going to be brought to the ramp of the Mizbeach. So the pious supervisor, the Mishnah continues and says, Mi mala evarim lakevish. Which Kohanim are going to bring up the limbs of the animal to the ramp? Now we have one of six Kohanim, Harosh Vaharegel. One Kohen is going to take the head and the right leg of the animal. So that's actually lottery winner number five. But the first Kohen responsible for the animal parts. But this is winner number five. Ushte Hayadayim, the next Kohen, who's winner number six, but he's number two as far as the parts of the animal are concerned. He's going to take the two hands, which means we call them the hands, the two front legs of the animal. Our winner number seven, remember we're going always to the right of the person who won his not finger number, is the 82 or 76, whatever it was. We're moving to the right. So our winner, number seven, who's going to be the third Kohen with animal parts limbs, he's going to take the ogets, and see in your picture, it's the hind part of the animal, the haregel, and the left leg, one Kohen. Each Kohen got two things, one to put in his right hand, one to put in his left hand. So that was Kohen number seven, who is taking up the third set of parts of the animal. <clears throat> We now go, that was Ha'ogetz Varegel. We're now up to Hechaza Vahagera. Chaza, you can see, is the lower half of the animal, what we call the chest of the animal that's facing the ground. Vahagera and the throat, okay, you can, what, we, what, the, what is considered the throat. Those two parts are brought up by the fourth Kohen, who's responsible for the parts. And then you have a Kohen who's going to do, and by the way, that was lottery winner number eight, I believe. And then you have lottery winner number nine, who's the going to bring up the last parts of the animal, the Shteha de Fanos. Seeing a picture showing you a side, there's a left side and a right side to the animal. Hakravayim and the insides of the animal that had to be brought eventually on the Mizbeah. So we have six Kohanim who are in charge of bringing up the parts of the animal that were cut in the Beis Hamet Bachayim that we just looked at in Mitos number three. So how many winners do we have so far? 
Well, we had four winners before we got to the animal. The person, the coin who is going to chef. That was our winner number one. He was finger 82. To his right was the Kohen who was going to be Zorik, sprinkle the blood. To his right, number three, the Kohen that was going to go into the Heichel and clean the uh, Mizbeah Hakatoris. Winner number four, to his right, was the Kohen that was going to go into the Heichel and clean the Menorah. That's four. Now we begin, as we read the Mishnah, six Kohanim who are going to bring the limbs or the parts of the animal to the Mizbeach. So we had our first four winners, Shochei, Zorei, Medashin, Mizbeach, Hapnini, Medashin, Hamenora. That's four winners. Six winners who are going to bring the body parts of the animal to the Mizbeach. That's ten. And now we continue the Mishnah. We need a page number. We are on now page 17. And we have the last three winners. This has nothing to do with body parts. Hasolas, flour. There was flour that had to be brought every day with a carbon tumbage shal shach and a carbon tumbage shal bain arbaim, the flour offering. Winner number 10 brought the flour to the Mizbeach. Next, Chavitin, winner number 11. Remember, going back to Midos number three, at Shar Nikonor, going up the 12 steps, there was a room to the right and a room to the left. The room to the left was the room of Pinchas Hamalbish. Pinchas was the supervisor over the, co the clothing of Kohanim, and that's where the clothing was stored. To keep it simple, we had a much more in-depth conversation with Seth Demidos. That's the room on the left at the top of the 15 steps. The room to the right at the top of the 15 steps is, <clears throat> to the left, is Lishkas Osei Chavit. And this was the room where they baked, not, that's not the right word, they fried. Uh, 12 chalos in a fry pan. Every single day, the Kohen Gadol had to pay for flour to have 12 chalos, not the ones we think about grated, but made in a fry pan. That's why it's called chavitin. Six of them were offered with the morning carbon plummet, and six were offered with the afternoon carbon plummet. So we needed a, a winner to take the six breads, the six chalos, up to the ramp. That's our winner number 12. Vahayayin. And then we need win a winner. He's number 12. <clears throat> He's actually 13. Okay. In uh, Vahashe Vesaboda, picture 76, they're showing you a picture of the Kohanim who went into the Lishka Tashmanim, the oil room, which we learned about Masech Demidus, and we get to it, Masech the Talmud will review it again. But they went into the room and they brought out oil, flour, that's where it was stored. <clears throat> hey, Fisu, the lottery was done. Zacha Misha Zacha. Whoever was Zacha, was Zacha. We have 13 winners. Reading the Mishnah quickly. One, Mishochet. It looks like there are 20 Kohanim in the Lishkas Hagazis. The supervisor, the Mamuna says 82. They put out their, they put out their fingers and they start, and the Mamuna starts counting. Winner, finger 82. You're the Shoiche, number one. Number two, next to him. You're going to sprinkle the blood. Number three, next to him. You're going to clean the Mizbeach Haktores in the Heichel. Number four, you're going to clean the Menorah in the Heichel. Number five, you're going to take the head and the right leg of the animal to the ram. 
Number six, you're gonna take the front legs of the animal to the rim. Number seven, you're going to take the hind part and the left leg of the animal. Number eight, you're going to take the chest area and the throat. Number nine, you're going to take the two sides of the animal and the insides. I'm sorry, number eight takes the two sides. Those are considered two parts. Number nine, you win. You will take the innards of the animal to the ram. Number 10, you will bring the flower for the flower offering. Number 11, am I off again? Let's see. I got it right. Shochet one, Zorik two, Medashim is there, Hapnimi three, Medashim, Hamanova four. The Rosh and the Regal five, Shte Yadayim six, Oketz Regal seven, Chazagera eight, Shte Defanos nine, Kravayim, the insides of the animal are ten, Solas is 11, Chavit in the six uh, Chalos in the morning and the six in the afternoon is 12. The wine, the Yayin is number 13. Okay. Now, if you remember, we talked about Ben Katin. Ben Katin is the one that made the Muchni. He made the pulley system for the Kiar so that at night the water that's left in the Kiar would not become possible and have to be spilled out. He made a system, a bar, mikvah, and you were able to put the Kiar, lower it into the bar uh, so that at night it wouldn't be nifsal balina. And then in the morning you were able to lift the Kiar out of the bar and use the water. You wouldn't have to waste water that was in the kiyar became holy water. It was not pro appropriate to spill out the water because you can't use it if the water just remained in the kiyar the whole night. It became possible to use the next day. It's called lena, sleeping over, or it not being used during the night. So in order to avoid that, Muchni ben Katen made this pulley system and the bar. He also refurbished the Kiyar. The Kiyar originally only had two, um, two places to wash your hands and your feet, two faucets. And he made it into 12. He did it, he made 12 because he wanted the Kohanim that win pious number two. How many Kohanim win pious number two? 13. So you need 13 Kohanim to wash their hands and their feet so they can go out and start doing the avoda, the shkita, etc., and get the thing going. And so that when, it, when there were only two faucets, there would have to be a line there, and it would take time for everybody to wash their hands and their feet, so that the avoda could be done more efficiently and more quickly. He refurbished the kiyar so that it would have 12 faucets, and now 12 kohanim can wash at one time, and the second pious can all wash at the same time. But question, Lublin, you we just read in the Mishnah that there are 13 winners to pious number two. And Much ben Katen only made 12 faucets on the Kiyar. So one Kohen doesn't have a faucet to wash from. You're correct. There's one Kohen who's the Shochet, the one who shechts the animal, the first winner, he doesn't have to do Kiddush Yadai and Raglayim. Why? Why? Because we explained earlier that Shechita is Kesheira Bazaar. You don't have to be a Kohen to Shecht the Nanam a Karabin. You can be a Levi, you can be a Sro. Although they prefer to have a Kohen do the Shechita for the Karabin Tomet since it's a public mm -hmm. offering. But Shechita love Avodi. Shrit is not considered Navoda, it's kosher bizarre. Therefore, the winner of the lottery who did the Shrit, our finger 82, he can shech the animal without washing his hands and the feet from the kiyar. So how many Kohanim would have to wash their hands and feet from the kiyar, being winners of lottery two? Only 12. And so Ben Katen refurbished the kiyar so that there would be 12 faucets so that all the Kohanim that needed to wash their hands and their feet for lottery number two would be able to do it all together 
and quickly. I want to mention that while the, the, the Mishnah is counting the 13 winners, this is not necessarily the order of how things were done. So for example, this is how the pious is done. Finger 82, you're going to shift. Finger 83 or next person, you're going to sprinkle the blood. Person number three, you're going to clean the mispeach in the hechel. Person number four, you're going to clean the menorah. That's not the order, though. Those are the winners. In other words, cleaning the mispeach in the hechel and cleaning the menorah in the hechel were done before the shechita of the carbon tomid. They cleaned the mizbeach haktores in the hechel, and they cleaned the menorah in the hechel before they shechted the animal to start the carbon tomid. So the reason they did the pious this way, why didn't they say, winner number one, you go clean the Mizbeh HaKtores. Winner number two, you go clean the menorah. Winner number three, you shek, because that's the order. They did it this way because Shrita, <clears throat> the slaughtering of the animal, begins the Iker Avoda. The Iker Avoda there is bringing Karbonus. So they announced the winners as, you shek, you sprinkle the blood. The first two winners, because that's the Iker Avoda, the carbon. And then they went to the rest of the avoda. You go clean the mizbeach in the heichel. You go clean the menorah in the heichel. Even though cleaning the mizbeach in the heichel and cleaning the menorah in the heichel would have occurred first before the shrit. Let's take a look at <coughs> quickly the next mishnah. Tomid Perek Beis Mishnah. Mishnah Beis, page 18. There's a beautiful, beautiful idea in this Mishnah. They have to figure out when uh, there's enough light in the sky to begin the day of order. Remember, the winner of the first lottery, he did Shumas Hadashin before dawn. They set up the logs on the Mizbeah before dawn. In all likelihood, they ignited the fires on the two Marajos before dawn. According to many shitas, they put the leftover limbs from yesterday that they had put on the side of the Mizbeah, they put it back now on the Marocha Gedola before dawn. How did they know when it's dawn? The first thing that would really happen after dawn is the Kohen who won the first lottery would put two additional pieces of wood on the Marocha Gedola. But how do you know when it's, there's enough light in the sky that the daytime avoda can begin? And that's what the Mishnah now describes, absolutely beautiful. Amalahem Hamamuna, the Mamuna, a supervisor. But here the word supervisor, Rashi tells us, is not one of the 15 supervisors that uh, administered or took care of the Avod in the Beis Hamikdash. Here the word Mamuna means the Skan Kohen Gadol, the backup Kohen Gadol. The backup Kohen Gadol is the next person in our picture. The first pious Jumas Hadeshin has done, been done. The second pious of 13 Kohanim has been done. But now we're ready to start with the Shechita of the Korban Tomim. And this needs, we need to know that it's daytime. How do we know? How do we know there's enough light in the sky? So the Skan, the Mamuna, the assistant Kohen Gadol would say, Tzur u imidiyas mana Shechita. It's now time for some of you Kohanim, one, two, go out into the courtyard of the Beis Hamikdash and see if the time of Shrita Sakarbin has arrived. How do you do that? So, let's see, I think we sent out a picture from, yeah, we sent out a picture. It's misnumbered. This may be tumbled number seven, actually, but it looks like this. <clears throat> you have a Kohen in the courtyard, and you have a Kohen at the top here, looking towards the sky. He's looking towards east. He wants to see if there's enough light in the east yet. How do they communicate with each other? No cell phones, and we really don't want people screaming at each other. 
So how do they communicate? They communicate very nicely. This is what they said to each other. Imigia, if there's enough light in the sky, Haroa Omer Bakai, the person that's standing on top of this building, he looks east, and if he sees enough light in the sky, he says Barkai. Barkai means Barak, Levrok. It's shining, there's enough light in the sky. What does that enough light in the sky mean? It's very, very, very early in the morning, which means it's literally dawn. When he sees spark of that first light in the meaning in, in the sky, that first light, he says Barkai. Barkai is now an indication to this Kohen that he can tell everyone else, go ahead. You can put the, the, the winner of the first out lottery, can put the two pieces of wood on the Marocha. The winner of the second lottery can shech, and the avoda can begin once he says, the Kohen up here says, Barkai, it's shining, which means it's dawn, it's very early. Masi ben Shmuel Omer, Masi ben Shmuel disagrees with the Shita and says that's not enough light in the sky to begin the avoda. Next, uh, alos, dawn, is simply not the appropriate time to start the avoda. You need more light in the sky. Masi ben Shmuel Omer, therefore he says the process is as follows. <clears throat> the person standing on the top here says, Heir Pinei Kol Hamizra, the whole east is lit up. The whole east is lit up means it's a little before Netzachem. Between dawn and sunrise, halachically, there's approximately 72 minutes. So if someone says, Alos is at five in the morning, you can approximate that Netz is about 6.12 in the morning. So, for example, a fast day, such as Shiva Sabatamas, Habo Leino, it should be a Yontif, Yahopech, Miyoga, and Lasimcha, Imheira, you have to stop eating by Alos Hashacha. You can't eat after Alos Hashacha. Alos Hashacha is dawn. That first light in the sky says, halachically, it is day. 72 minutes later is Netz, which has its own halachic uh, rules. But the halachic day actually begins at dawn. And therefore, the first sheet in the Mishnah says that the person looking towards the east, once he sees some light, which means dawn, he says, Barkai, it's shining. And you can then start the avoda because halachically at dawn, it's day. Masya ben Chorish disagrees. And he has a reason that he learns this out of, that dawn, although halachically okay to do mitzvahs, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we'll do it right now before I forget. For example, al pi halacha, you are allowed to break a bracha and shake your rule of an esrig at dawn and yoyt the mitzvah. Al pi halacha, you can read the Megillah and Purim at dawn and yoyt the mitzvah. Chazal, however, ruled that one should not do that. All mitzvah should be performed at netz hachama. All mitzvah should be performed at sunrise. Why? Because it's very difficult to tell that second or those moments when dawn hits you may be a little too early and therefore you may be shaking the lulav while it's really still night and you think there's enough light to create dawn and there's not. You may read a couple of words in the Megillah while it's night and then dawn hits. You're not Yotze because part of the Megillah was read at night. So Chazal said we need a clear indication for people and the clear indication is sunrise. So Netzachama is the time where the vast majority of mitzvahs are done, even though halachically, at dawn, it is day. So the first sheet in the Mishnah says, once the person 
sees enough light in the sky that it's dawn, he says, Bakai, it's shiny, and you can start the Avoda. Masi Ben Shmuel says, no, no, no. The Avoda should not start at dawn. It should start later, closer <coughs> to sunrise. And therefore, the person standing up here would say, not Barkai, something shining. He would use different words. Heir Pinei Kol HaMizra is the whole east now lit up. Once he said the whole east is lit up, it means it's close to Netzacham, but that's not still good enough. Ad Shehu the person down here who's listening, he asks a question now. You just said the whole east is lit up, but is there enough light in the east that the light would hit Hebron? And the person standing on top here would say, yes, there's enough light that uh, it can be shining in Hebron. What is that last question and answer? The person at the top already said, the east is lit up, so it's Netzacham. Why does he get a question, is there enough light in Hebron? And then he has to answer, yes, there's enough light in Hebron. So the Yushalmi tells us that the reason why this was done is because this is the signal to start the Avod in the Beis Hamikdash. Until he declares there's enough light, you don't start the Avod in the Beis Hamikdash, the Shechita. And before we start the Avod in the Beis Hamikdash, we want to shout out Hebron to remind ourselves of the Zuchus of Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Zara, Rivka, Leah in Hebron. We want to remember our Zuchus Avos before we begin the Avod in the Beis Hamikdash. That's a beautiful idea. That we don't go to start Avod in the Beis Hamikdash until we remember Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Zara, Rivka, Leah, and of course Rachel is doing her own Tfilis in Shemayim. And that's how we start the Avoda. We start the Avoda before anything is done that requires daytime. The person shouts, the person says, Hey, Pene Kalam Isra, the whole East is lit up. And the person below says, Ad Hevron, is there light in Hevron? And he answers yes. And the only reason to ask that question, is there light in Hevron, is just to say the word Hevron. And when you say the word Hebron, people will remember Hebron, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Leah, of course, Rachel. And with that, we're ready to do our vote when we remember the Avos in Hebron. And that's one of the reasons why when we begin Shemona Esrei, we begin Shemona Esrei, we're going to, Shemona Esrei takes the place of our Korban Tomit. When we begin Shemona Esrei, in the base Hamikdash, how do they begin the Avoda every day? How do they know that they can start the Avodah? Chevron. Why? Because I have to remember Avram Yitzhak Yaakov, so Rivka Rachaleya. And our Shemona Esrei, before we start our Shemona Esrei, and we're going to uh, say the Shemona Esrei to a place, at least, Adboi Mashiach, and then there'll be a different filler from Harry Amenu. We also say, You don't go into Shemayin Esrei until you say, And that's the same idea as the Beis HaMikdash, Hevron. And that's how you know to begin the Avod. Okay, so that is Tomid, Perek, Gimel, Mishnah Beis, Mishnah Aleph, and Mishnah Beis.